Now, um, <laughs> this word, I don't even hardly know what to think about it. Because I was, I've been hearing this the last couple of days. Um, I was just writing it literally, what, an hour ago? <laughs> Pam, as I was hearing some things in my spirit. And uh, it shouldn't be very long at all. Now, every time I say that, y'all get scared because you say, I know what she have, happens when she says that. But it shouldn't be long, but it is significant and it is important. I believe that. Hand me my phone. Will you do that, please? Um, yeah, it's down there somewhere in my purse or something. And let me just pray. And I want y'all to pray with me. And let's ask the Holy Spirit to say to us what he wants to say tonight. And that we will hear whatever it is he is wanting to say in the name of Jesus. Lord, we acknowledge you. You're everything. Lord, I don't want to just come up here and talk and profit nothing. I want this to be your words. So, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit that's here among us and with us, help me. Help me. Help me. Lord, let these words be rhema. Let them be life. And Oh, I pray it, God, from your heart. And Lord, just give us ears to hear what you're saying. In Jesus' name, give us hearts that say yes, even before you say it. I give you the praise for it all, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Now, forgive me if I have to stay close to notes. I'm like not like those young Casey Dosses and Micah Woods that never need a note. I don't even know how that happens, but what, how they do that. Well, they're young, that's how, and smart, very. But uh, I'm afraid I have to stick a little close to these notes. But um, I'm just going to preach something tonight that I'm hearing for myself. I have not attained. I'm going to tell you that up front because I need the mercies of the Lord in this because the Bible says, and you know where this is, where he says the teachers are going to be held to a higher standard than even everybody else. So before I preach this, I'm going to preface it by saying, mercy, Lord, mercy. <laughs> like Paul, I've not attained this, but I'm working at this. I'm working on this. And this is a word that, that I'm hearing for, for me. And I just figured since I'm being rebuked, you should be too. <laughs> right? So I just feel like I need to share that, that, that rebuke. I share my blessings, share my rebukes. There we go. So just, it, it, and it's a good rebuke. It's, it, sometimes those things kind of, kind of, thank you, honey. They can hurt, but they can feel good at the same time, right? This one kind of is that for me. But uh, just to even begin this, I want to begin this thought and just take this little thought journey with me. It's still in the process of being baked. But for just a little ramp recap, a little word, not, not a little word, but a very significant word that we've said over and over. And it's good that we say it over and over so that we can remember it well. Because I found if you don't say it over and over and you don't hear it a lot, you will forget it. Mm. And you do not need to forget anything that you know God has said. And some of these words that we've received from the Lord, there is no doubt that we know God said this. It lines up with this word, which is the first criteria criteria for anything we ever think we've heard from God, from whatever form it comes in, it lines up with this word, right? Amen. And so whenever it's lined up with this word and we have no doubt about it, we know we've heard from God, then we pay attention. And this is that word, what I've told you to do. Good. You do know it. What I've told you to do, do it now. Time is of the essence. Now, follow me. Now, this is what I've been hearing this week. Thank you to a book that you recommended. Time is of the essence does not mean that you live in a frantic state of chaotic urgency. Because that's just stressful. And the Lord does not want you to live in a place of stressful urgency. He wants you to know time is of the essence. He wants you to know that things are urgent, and they are. But that doesn't mean that you just crank up more to do. It means 
to me that you are leaning in to hear what matters the most. How to prioritize in our lives what really matters so that we can do what we are called to do effectively from a place of rest. Mm. Jesus was never in a hurry. Thank you. He was never stressed. Think about that. A servant's not greater than his master. If he did it as an example, he intends for us to learn to live that way. Okay? You'd have never seen him freaking out over anything real dramatic and, and in a big hurry. Come on, come on, come on, come on. He knew that he walked in the timing and the will of his father and in the peace of God. It didn't mean he was lazy. It didn't mean that he was just, you know, whatever. It means that he had prioritized what matters the most. So I've been thinking about this today. I think we're at a good time right now with this word to look at it and sort of draw in our lives this chart, two sides, okay? Since he has said what I've told you to do, do it now. Time is of the essence. On this side of our chart, let's write. On this side of our chart, let's write. What has he told me to do? You start writing in your mind. What has he told me to do? Without a doubt. What, what has he told me? Now, if you say, Miss Karen, I don't know, then you need to go on a prayer and fasting vigil until you hear. It's not that hard. He really wants you to know what he's wanting you to do. <laughs> so it ain't going to take long. List that down, what he's told you to do. So on this side, we've got what has he told me to do. And on this side, we've got what am I doing? <laughs> and how do these two things differ? Okay. So if I'm going to look over here, here's what he's told me to do. And I know it. Here's what I'm doing. So you need to look at your life, your everyday life. All the stuff that every day is consuming your life. And at this point where we are on the journey, let's begin to prioritize this side of the chart over here. Get this established, and then let's look at this side and go, you got to go, and you got to go, and you matter. I'm keeping you, and you don't matter. You're going. And then you look over here, and you go, hmm, you're good. You're a good thing. You're good, and I could. but I think there's something better. I read this today on the way here. Luke 10. Where am I? I'm sorry, y'all. Sorry, I don't have my stuff ready. It's real fresh. Luke 10, verse 38. New Living. As Jesus and his disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha was wel welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted. But Martha was distracted. But Martha was distracted. By the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come in here and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha. King James, I think, says, Martha, Martha. You are worried and upset over all these details. And there is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken from her. Heard this today in my spirit. Such a word for me right now. Martha is distracted. Here's the interesting point, though. She's doing a good thing. Dinner is good. Dinner's not sin. Dinner's needed. I love dinner. You love dinner. All God's children love dinner. We all love dinner. Yeah. 
But for Martha, working with the good was producing stress. And for Mary, working with God was producing peace. It's, it's interesting to realize that sometimes what is good actually becomes an enemy of God. And you look at this picture. I've got Martha in the kitchen where, to be honest with you, I'm very familiar with that kitchen. And I think a lot of us are. Got Mary at the feet of Jesus. You've got the good and you've got the better. And the interesting thing is, is the better isn't always easy. It really isn't. It looks easy. She's just sitting there. But she's sitting there knowing Martha is so ticked at me. You know Mary knew Martha was very aggravated. Martha was probably up there behind Jesus giving her eyes and everything else. You know she was. She was like. <laughs> Until Martha had just had it. And Mary's sitting there knowing, I know I should be. I know that she's ticked. I know I'm going to hear about this later. I know she needs me. But I need him. So what Mary was doing wasn't necessarily the easiest choice, but it was intentional. Because in the King James version of that story, Jesus says it like this, Mary has chosen this good part, this good thing, this better thing. In other words, for us to, to do what God is calling us to do, we're going to have to make it very intentional. You're going to have to leave the kitchen when you know you're needed. You're going to have to step away from things that are sometimes good. And with an intentional effort and an intentional plan, whatever that plan looks like, to know I've got to choose the better. You've got to do whatever it takes. If it does make people mad, if other people in the family don't understand, your dorm friends don't understand, you've got to do what you know is the better part. It's interesting because it just all looks like the, the, the typical way that things with God usually are in the kingdom especially. This upside down kingdom. Because whenever you look, Mary proved to us that sometimes less is more. Yeah. And it makes me wonder what would have happened if, Mar if Martha had have come in there and when Jesus says to her what he says, oh, Martha, Martha, you're just all frustrated, nervous, and all that, and stressed about the, the dinner. And look, Mary's chosen the good part, and I'm not going to take it from her. What would have happened if Martha had said, well, you know what? Forget this. Take up this apron. Throw this spatula down. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be in that kitchen if, if, you know, if I can have this too. So you know what? Dinner can wait. Mary, scoot over. <laughs> scoot over. Make some room for me too. I don't know. I just wonder. The Bible didn't say what she did after that. I'd love to know. Did she go back to the kitchen? Because I'd like to think that she just said, you know what, I, I, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to listen to what he's saying. I am stressed about this stuff that I don't need to be stressed about. You're concerned about things that do not matter. Mary, get on over. I, there's room for both of us right here. And sat down at the feet of Jesus and just taking it in. And you know what would have happened? Probably that dinner would have been taken care of supernaturally. Probably because the dinner, after he got through speaking, everybody would have been hungry. But if, I'm, if I know Jesus well enough, the last time he had a dinner dilemma, he took the loaves and fishes, blessed it, and fed 5,000 men and all their families. He was a walking catering company. He could have provided the dinner. Everything would have been taken care of if Martha had just been willing to say, I'm going to take off this apron, I'm going to put down this spatula, and I'm going to sit here like Mary and hear what he's got to say. Come on, you know the better is so much better than the good. So those three words is what stuck out to me in this story. Martha was distracted. Martha was distracted. Mm -hmm. We, listen to me good individually and corporately as a ministry, we have an enemy to our purpose. Several actually, but I'm talking about one particular one tonight. We have an enemy to our purpose. Listen to me. If that, an enemy that's saying, if I can just keep her or him distracted by good, I can render them ineffective. Why? Because the enemy fears your focus. 
He fears your focus. Oh, yes, he does. He fears your faith, your ability to hear, because faith comes by hearing the word of God. So if he can keep you distracted, you'll be able to hear good. You won't even have faith, because faith is going to come by hearing what God is saying that gives you faith. He fears your focus, because actually that will produce faith, because it causes you to lean in and hear. He fears your prayers. Now, we're going to take an interesting turn here, but this is what I felt. I want to thank God for Chase Durkin because God has used him in many ways in my life and in this ministry, and I'm thankful he runs with us in this mission. Without going into the details of of this, Chase had an encounter with God last week that uh, it was really... Yes, a dream, but it was more than a dream. It was more like a dream encounter, a dream experience. And I'm not going to go into all the details of that, but I am going to tell you the main part of what I believe God was saying to us in it. In this encounter he had with Jesus in this dream, in this word, he comes into this heavenly, literally, place. Long story short, he asked the angel angels, why am I here? Jesus answers it and says he is here to receive a message. As they begin to talk, he tells Chase this message to to bring back to the earth, to bring back to us. And here was the message. Chase said, what is the message? And this is what Jesus said. Tell my people to stop gazing at the deep darkness. Tell them to look at me. When I heard this word, it connected me back to a distracted Martha. Because we are having such distractions with this darkness. Stop gazing at the deep darkness. Look at me. Whenever I heard this, I just, whoa. Just went into my spirit heavy. Mm. Because the, one of the, really the first thing I thought of, to be honest with you, the deep darkness, whenever I thought about it, when he said it, this is what I saw. I wish this thing wasn't even on. I wish it was just the black face on it because it's, I want you to see what that looks like when it's just no screen. It's just this dark looking abyss. And I heard somebody the other day, it was a friend of mine said that her pastor calls these things pocket idols. He said before he preaches, he tells everybody, put up your pocket idols. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I thought about that because I thought about here we are carrying these things around. You know, we don't have little statues of Buddha. We don't have little statues of, you know, whatever. We just got other kinds. This is what the Lord's dealing with me about. When I think of what Jesus said, stop staring, stop gazing, not just staring, stop gazing at the deep darkness. I, it was weird because just yesterday, we were at, in an airport, was it yesterday, the day before yesterday, Friday, flying back from Florida. And I was at the Atlanta airport, and I told Pam and Abigail, I said, guys, look around, look, look at this airport. Look at this Atlanta airport. I would say 98 to 99% without exaggeration. We're gazing. Every person, there's thousands of people in that airport. And I just said, I want y'all to look, look, look. Even the people standing, if they're standing, they're doing this. If they're sitting, they're doing this. It is like this. I told them, I said, just think about what angels feel like that come from heaven to the earth. And they're walking around looking right now at this generation all over the world. And pretty much anywhere you go, anywhere. It's like we've been hypnotized by this thing. The only thing I can look at it is is, is it makes me think of a black hole. You know, they have black holes in the universe. Where they say that the gravitational pull in those black holes is so strong and powerful that even light cannot escape it. It's a pull that sucks you into it and there is no escape from it. 
I feel like right now that in the spirit realm, our enemy is trying to create this dark hole of sorts that pulls a generation into its dark influences through what appears to be subtle ways. And before you realize what's happening, you are yielding to compromise. Your standard is crumbling. You're lulled into a spiritual stupor that has left you numb and ineffective. <laughs> Martha was distracted. This church, I'm talking about the church, is distracted. Why does this matter so much? Because we can't hear his voice. And if we can't hear his voice, we're lost. Come on, y'all. If we, if we find ours, and, and if we're lost because we can't hear his voice, we'll find ourselves devoured by the darkness and immobilized by the fear. And I don't want you to sit there, and I don't think you are. I really don't. But I think there's some places that would think this. Oh, great. Now, talk about sister legalism. She's, now she's preaching against phones. No. <laughs> the phone is not bad, just like Martha's dinner wasn't bad. In many ways, just like Martha's dinner, it's needed and it's good. I use this thing to preach on. This is a platform to me to preach and encourage people all over the world. So it's not like this thing is sin to have. I'm talking about when this thing right here becomes our source of pleasure, purpose, identity, acceptance, opinion. And influence. I'm talking about when this thing right here is controlling us instead of us controlling it. When we treat it like a close friend that we can't live without. We almost sleep with the thing. I've been talking to it this week. And I ain't talking about talking to Siri. I'm talking about, I put that phone down the other day. Yesterday at my house. I just started talking to it. You're not my best friend. You are not going to control me. I just started telling it. You're not going to control my life. Me and you, we're setting up some boundaries in our relationship. I want you to know that right now. And I'm the one setting the boundaries. I'm the one in charge here. I'm the one going to tell you what to do. That's right. You are not going to dominate my schedule or the way I think. We're not going to be fellowshipping as much, nearly as much as what we used to. Nope. You're not ever going to be an idol in my life. You're distracting me from what's more important. I get that. So you're not going to dominate me anymore. Nope. That's what we need to say. Paul told Timothy, and I don't have time to thought about it. Paul told Timothy in the last days, people will be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. How do you know if this thing is an idol in your life? Well, I'll, let's start here. Have you checked that weekly report they send you about how much time you spend every day on this? Isn't that nice of them to send us a little report? That might be the one thing God did on these phones is to send that report to us so that we would know whenever we're just thinking to ourselves, I don't know why, I just don't have time to pray. I just don't. I don't have time. I just don't have time for a devotional. I just can't get up. I just can't. I don't know. I just don't spend the time with him. I don't have time to read the word. I just don't. Your average time this week, up 13%, six hours and 35 minutes a day. No, think about it, y'all. No joke, for real. Let's think about that. Let's think about it. Let's compare. Is this an idol in my life? Well, let's look at the two worlds. Would you rather be with him or him? It's a good way to put it. Yeah. So I've decided I'm going to let you know when I need you. I'm going to be letting you know if I need to ask you something that, that you, I think you might know. I'll let you know when I need you. Come on. But other than that, you know what? This is my life source. This is my bread. This is my water. This is my news. Come on. This is what I live on right here. This is my nourishment. It's the voice of my father. So we ain't going to be fellowshipping no more. Well, not saying no more. We're going to, it's balance. Honey, it's balance. 
You don't mean I'll never look at Pinterest again? I like Pinterest. <laughs> but me and Pinterest just going to have some boundaries. <laughs> Listen to this first. This is where we're fixing to do a little shift. And this is important. This is why this matters to me. Listen good, y'all. Jesus says to tell us. He said to, he told Chase, tell them, stop gazing into the deep darkness. Look at me. Look at me. Now, think about that thing about darkness. Y'all, even in, 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 in Isaiah 60, he tells us that darkness he says in the King James, gross darkness will cover the earth, okay? But actually the truth is that's the time the church arises and shines, at least if we've got a light to shine with. It's what we're supposed to be doing, not freaking out and bound in fear and all that and running to hide. No, we ain't going to hide in the dark. We're going to let our light shine, right? But how can we let our light shine if we're fellowshipping with the darkness, if we're hanging out with it, if we're living with it? Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 11. I love in the old King James. It just says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And just think about that. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. This is a word that's huge for me right now in my life. That, y'all, that's the Bible, by the way. Jesus said, uh, the, the Holy Spirit wrote it. The Holy Spirit said it through Paul. Don't, don't hang out. Don't have fellowship with anything that has to do with darkness. That spirit of darkness. It doesn't mean don't go get people that are not Christians. We want to pull them out of the darkness. But don't hang around darkness as letting darkness be your friend. Darkness is not your friend. Okay? Lauren, I want you to come up here and share with me, share with them some of the things you told me that you were hearing. She and I have been talking a lot about this over the last few, several days. And she was sharing me some stuff on the phone the other day, and I'm like, Lauren, that is so good. I had her to actually share some of it on my porch the other day. And I just want her to share with you some of the things that she's been hearing about darkness as it pertains to us. Then I'll wrap it up. Well, this has been, as soon as I heard, as soon as I heard the dream that Chase had, I saw the exact same thing. My phone was sitting on the table whenever mom shared the dream with me, and I was like, Mom, look at how dark my phone is right now. It's just, there's something about that. And I was thinking about this. I want to read this first with this too, and then I'm going to get into what I was just sharing. But in Matthew 6, this is what Jesus says. He says, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness how deep that darkness is. And then he goes right on and he says this, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. And then it says you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. The scriptures in reference to money, but, but we are enslaved to, well, I, I'm sorry to harp on this, but this is my soapbox. Arson knows that about me. <laughs> the second you're right now. Um, but we are enslaved to this thing because Romans 6 says that whenever, whenever you're enslaved to something, you respond to it. Whenever that thing calls to you, you respond to it. Whenever this thing dings, you can't not respond to it. It calls and you answer it. You answer it with action. You obey what it's telling you to do. And I was just thinking about how the light that we have in here is artificial light. These lights that we have the light on the phone, all of this is artificial light. And yet if I were to take a pot full of dirt and I bring it in here and I plant a seed in it and I put it here and I water it and I water it and I'm faithful to it and I'm I'm watching over this seed, this light does not bring life. This is artificial life, It's, it's actually darkness. Now, my eye right now is looking at it and seeing light, and I'm seeing you, and and we're seeing light because we can see it's artificial light, but my body's not producing vitamin D in it. 
your body produces vitamin D whenever you walk into the sun. You don't eat vitamin D in your diet. You have to walk out into the sun. That's why vitamin D is something that gives us true joy and happiness. That's why people get sad in the winter. It's seasonal depression disorder. It's a real thing that people have to have treated. And in really in Britain, they really deal with that because there's so much gray and darkness. And so people stay inside. And they don't get the, the sunlight as much. But your body makes vitamin D. And whenever we only live in this artificial light, and we only fill our eyes with artificial light, there's nothing life-giving. There's nothing giving you life from this. You actually have to get out and enjoy what God created to receive that nourishment from him. So there's, there's that scripture that's just really challenging I feel like because we can be so fooled by what we think is light it's easy for us to experience artificial light and think it's this is okay and what what I was um what I was talking with mom about of course you guys know my testimony I was delivered from a spirit of fear because fear is a spirit it's a demonic spirit it it's a demonic spirit Paul says in Timothy, he says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And yet this thing with darkness is something, and end with fear too, and um, is this what you were talking about? Yes. Okay. I wanted to be sure before I go into it. <laughs> this thing with darkness is something that, especially right now in this season, we kind of crack the door open just a little bit and say... Everybody else celebrates it. It, it. it has to be okay because so-and-so, they obviously love God and they go to church and they are, you know, live this whole thing and, and it's, uh, it, it's got to be okay. And so it's okay for me to watch this movie and to play around with this spirit of fear. Here's the danger in that is if fear is a spirit and it is, it does not play your games and it does not obey your rules. We think that it's okay to just crack the door and let it in and think it will stay contained in the box that I want it to stay in and it will play my game by the rules and it will not in infiltrate the rest of my life because I have this little safe place for it. That's not the way that demonic spirits work. And we see this so many places in the scripture but I was just thinking about a couple in the book of James. It says this, for jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, spirit, unspiritual, and demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. And just, just one more place in, in Luke here. Luke 11, it says this, Jesus is teaching. And you guys know the verse, but just to go back and look at it. When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert searching for rest. But when it finds none, it says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds that its former home is all swept in an order. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all enter the person and live there. Now, here's the thing that we have to understand whenever we open the door to this thing of fear. It has friends. It has friends. And just like James said, whenever you have selfish ambition and jealousy, you have confusion and every evil work. Whenever you open the door to this darkness and we say, it's okay, I'm just going to let this one, little, this one little thing in. It's okay for this to happen because I have a safe little place, place prepared for this thing about fear. And, you know, it can live over here in the safe place for fear. It doesn't do that. It brings its friends. And you open up your life and you're going, why am I struggling with, you know, fill in the blank? Why is this happening in my home? Why, are my, why is my family in disorder? What is happening? You, we don't really understand fully the way that the spirit realm works in that. And I, I just know if Jesus and the word say so clearly... They make a very clear distinction between light and darkness. There's a very clear distinction. Yes. There is light and there is darkness. And he says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? 
How can these two things live together? They can't live together. And right here it says this. And it says, we are not to be in the dark about these things. We're not to live in the dark about these things. And he's talking about the day of the Lord's return, which is really why I think that this message is so important. And and God is telling us to not look at the deep darkness because the time is of the essence. The day that we're living in is really important whenever we look around that we don't have time to be distracted by this stuff. And we have to keep the door completely closed to the enemy that wants to invade our lives. And so he says, but you are not in the dark about these things, brothers and sisters. And you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. For you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to the darkness and to night. We don't belong. Whenever we look at that stuff, we should say, that doesn't belong. It doesn't belong. So be on your guard. Not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed. So let me, let me go back for just a second. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. And, and I think that that can even go back into some of that stuff where we just lull ourselves away from reality and step into this world where we don't have to be clear-minded and sober. We can just lull ourselves to sleep and pretend like what's happening is not really happening. I'm too tired to deal with it. Why am I too tired? We just, we can lull ourselves to sleep and and put our minds to sleep and not have to think about it and, and escape reality in our own way. Just get out of the reality. But night is the time. And part of that darkness is just living in oblivion to what is really, really going on. It's building a fantasy. So night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light... Be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. So good. Good. Come on. I love that. Let us be clear-headed. Let us be sober. Ben, I want you to go ahead and come, if you will. Now, just to recap this very quickly, okay? What I've told you to do, do it now. It's time to prioritize what he's told us to do and get rid of the stuff that we're doing that he didn't tell us to do. Okay? That's your home. I'm giving you a couple of homework assignments, actually. You with me on that one? I want you to identify that. Look at Miss Karen that loves you. Listen, I want you to hear me on this. Go home and I want you to think about you individually and then you individually affects us corporately. You were sent here by God with gifts we need. And part of the reason some of these gifts are not being released is you're so distracted, you're not able to operate fully in them because time's getting wasted. Identify what he told you to do. Get rid of what he didn't tell you to do, even if it's good. If he didn't tell you to do it, even if it's good, Martha, there's a better way. And he can still take care of it over here if you'll do the better thing. Okay? The next thing is, is to remember what he's told us. We've got to be careful that we're not distracted by the darkness. That's what, that's what I believe he was saying in the word that he gave to us through Chase. Stop gazing at the deep darkness. In other words, this darkness is a massive distraction to us. Yes. Let's find a, a balance. Let's get it in line with the Holy Spirit. We are dominated by his spirit, not by anything of this world. Last thing. This is your last homework assignment I'm giving you tonight. I want everybody to go home tonight and I want you just to read the whole chapter of Ephesians 5. That chapter for me is just, this week has just been really so interesting. Now, I'm going to close with this. I'm going to do you like RSM. Say, I'm listening, Miss Karen. I want you to listen to this last part. Good, all right. It's so fascinating that the, that In Ephesians 5, where that verse is, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, he deals with all kinds of stuff, actually. 
Here's how he ends that chapter. This is fascinating to me. You're going to think about, you're going to think, where are you going? Stay with me. Verse 21 of chapter 5, and further submit to one another. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Keep listening. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of the word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds it, cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. I'm almost done. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Then he says this, this is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Why would I read that? I just find it fascinating that at the end of chapter 5 of Ephesians, when he is telling us all of these things, actually the whole book is, Ephesians is one of my favorite books, but, but Ephesians is just full of this stuff that Paul is speaking to not only to edify the, the, the church, but to bring correction into the church. And why does that matter? It matters because of what he says here. He's talking about the way we live. Listen, the way we live. Saying to the bride of Christ, don't fellowship with darkness. Don't talk about certain things. Don't hang around certain people. There's a certain way you've got to live. This is matters. Why? Because you're the bride. You're the bride. And he's saying here, bride, just, just like a wife submits to her husband, and just like the husband loves his wife, like Christ loves the church, he's saying here, this is a great mystery, but I'm speaking about Christ and the church. This to me just came alive this week. I was trying to tell Pam about it. It's a God is great thing. It's like exploding in me. About why this matters that we as the bride of Christ do not fellowship with the darkness or the world. Why does this matter so much? Why does it matter that we, I love the fact that, that, that John says that Jesus said that in him there is no darkness at all. In God, there is no darkness at all. There's not even a little speck of darkness in him. Nothing in him but love and light. Whoa. I love it when Jesus said to his disciples, Satan has no place in me. Oh, I love that. Now here we are, the bride of Christ. This is just so strong that he says here I'm, that the bride is going to be presented to Christ. That's just huge. It's huge because it shows how much you matter. How much you matter. In other words, to the Father, He looks at you and He loves you and He sees you as the bride that He gives to His Son. The bride that is the reward of His suffering. You will be, watch, presented to Jesus as the gift, as the reward of His suffering. You were what He was willing to suffer for. You are a bride. And then He says this, not just any bride, a bride that is spotless, without blemish, not even a wrinkle in her garments. In other words, listen to me good. The father would never give the son and present to the son a bride that was an adulterous bride. He would never present to the son and give up him a, a bride that was a bride that was sort of had her eyes over here on somebody else whose affection was divided from the son. He would never give his son a bride that had a little darkness in her. No, no, no. This bride will be a glorious bride is what he called her. Without a spot, without a wrinkle, without a blemish. How is that going to happen? Because the one that she's being presented to 
bought her with his own blood and made her righteous. Come on. But it matters. It matters how we live and how we obey that voice and that we are preparing ourselves to be that bride that's living for him, wanting him, longing for him. Our affections are for him. I think that's why our groom is telling us right here, stop staring. Stop gazing at the darkness. Lift up your eyes and look at me, bride. Look at me, bride. Look at me. Oh, tonight, even in worship, I just stood there going, whoa, God. Because sometimes you can think of the bride as like this huge, the whole wide world, and it's true. But then I think about, that's me. I'm the bride. It's you. We can go big picture, but you need to go you, and I need to go me. You're the bride. I, you, will be presented to him as a bride. A bride that has no eyes except for him. Eyes for no one else. No other idols in my life. No other desires that supersedes my longing for him. A bride that's been waiting on him. A bride that's just, that, a bride that loves nothing more than him. He deserves nothing less than that. 